So hello and welcome everybody from all over the world. You're really, really welcome to this event, which we've been looking forward to. And this is an event that's part of Pivot Projects Pivot Week. It's exactly a year since we created Pivot Projects in response to the COVID outbreak all over the world. And we're very conscious that many of you will still be in a difficult situation in relation to the COVID outbreak and may have had um, family members and friends who've been affected. So we're, we're, we're very grateful you joined today. And, and of course, we all have to look after ourselves going forward. What we're going to do today is I'm going to very briefly introduce Alan Stoger from the Tauberg Foundation, who is then going to take uh, you forward for half the meeting um, with uh, some leadership stories and some magic from Mark Mitten, which is going to be very exciting. Uh, and after that, uh, in the second half, uh, Anne is going to, from the Global Leadership Academy, is going to introduce uh, a group of people who are going to talk about their stories of leadership from around the world. And then I'll say a few words at the end. So thank you all so much for joining. I think some of, some, some of these may be videos and some of them will be live. So we're very much looking forward to it and really thinking hard about what leadership in this uh, modern world is and what leadership is in relation to the problems that we're facing all over the world. Pivot Projects is a volunteer organization and I thought a, a, a word from Nelson Mandela might not go amiss at this point, that there's no greater gift than that of giving one's time and energy to help others without expecting anything in return. And that's very much what Pivot Projects is about. And I suspect a lot of people who are going to be talking today about what they're doing, it probably applies to them too. And when we created Pivot Projects, we set it up to try and prevent social and environmental disasters by helping people all over the world to find new ways to build a better future post pivot. And one of the things the group talked about was maybe lighting a thousand points of light in the world uh, to light up the darkness that we've been facing uh, over the last year or so. So we're a group of uh, volunteers and we're trying to help communities to develop collective intelligence with uh, the support of artificial intelligence. And, and, and the most important part is a systems approach to help everyone to flourish in the future. And I'd like to finish with something that we use every week in our meetings, which is a quote from the National Youth Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman, who spoke at, um, at, at the inauguration of the new president, Joe Biden. Uh, there is always light, only if we're brave enough to see it. There is always light, only if we're brave enough to be it. And with that, I'd like to introduce Alan Stoger, Stoger who uh, is a strategist and entrepreneur, according to his CV. Um, and he's had experience in communications, public relations, but most important right now, he serves as the executive chairman of the Tauberg Foundation, who very kindly uh, offered to host um, half of today's session. So I'd now like to hand over to Alan. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction and, and more importantly, for the invitation today. We're here to talk with you about leadership. And I think it's an easy argument to make that in a world this messed up, uh, we need new thinking on the one hand and new leadership and new leaders on the other hand. And in effect, that's what the Tuber Foundation is trying to do. We're trying to encourage new thinking for this new world. And we're trying to look for leaders, perhaps where they've not been looked before. Um, we are a 40 year old organization domiciled in Sweden, but operating globally. Uh, indeed, we shut our offices everywhere so that we have to be global. We have to be uh, both virtual and mobile. Uh, on the leadership side, what we're looking for and what we believe the world needs at the moment are leaders who are, who are bold, who are courageous, who are innovative. Uh, those whose work is based on universal values uh, and, 
above all things, that their work is global, that it may not be global in application yet, but it's global in possibility. And it's that global values-based leadership that we created the prize you just heard mentioned, Telberg, Telberg SNF Elias and Global Leadership Prize. Um, and one of the reasons I'm so excited to be with you today is we launched nominations uh, on Monday, on March 29th. Anyone anywhere in the world can nominate a great leader. Uh, there is, you can see right there, the, the URL to go find how to nominate. Uh, that leader will be selected through a process of pre-juries and juries, and ultimately will award four, four, will identify four great leaders, celebrate them at the end of the year, give them checks for $50,000, but far more importantly, pull them into a network of leadership whose purpose is, as I said at the top, to try to make things just a little bit better. Uh, and we're gonna meet some of those leaders uh, in the next few minutes. What I'd like to do though, is to start with truth and, truth and advertising. We call this the magic of leadership for a couple of reasons. Any of you who are leaders know you need magic sometimes. You get into that cul-de-sac and if you only had a magic wand, you could find your way out. Well, what better way to think about magic than with a magician? And I'm delighted to introduce next both a friend and a colleague, Mark Mitten, who is far and away one of the best magicians you will ever at least virtually meet. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Alan. And, um, and thanks, Peter. In thinking about what to do, uh, you know, what kind of magic to do at Pivot Week, I thought it was pretty obvious that we had to start off with a famous example of uh, systems thinking, just to, Peter, something just for you, and to celebrate Pivot Project's Pivot Week. And um, here I've got this uh, Rubik's Cube, and we'll mix it up just a little bit like so. And I hope this works. Um, I'm going to try mix this whole thing up like that. You can see it's pretty well gone. But Peter, I'm going to ask you to just hold your hand up and uh, wave your hand in the air, just like that. I don't know if you can hear me. Oh, that's there perfect. And then focus right on the cube here. And as you do, you'll see little changes being made. And uh, if you can all just think pivot, you'll see that very quickly the cube. Oh, that's perfect, Peter. Yeah, there you go. Thank it. you. That's excellent. And you can see it all comes right back as it should be. Uh, a perfect systems approach to complex problems. Very, <laughs> thank you. Uh, right now, we're gonna go to, uh, back to Alan, who's gonna tell you about an exciting panel. Thank you very much. Now watch, I can make Mark disappear. Uh, <laughs> but, but to the point, um, you're all leaders. You need magic every now and then. And it's sometimes making people disappear. It's making problems disappear. It's solving new problems. We're going to meet now three Telberg leaders. Um, and they're going to talk a bit about their own experience. Vishaka Desai is Columbia University's, the head of Columbia University's uh, global uh, thought center. Hello, Vishaka. Uh, you just met Selena DeSolo of Glasswing, based in El Salvador, does absolutely amazing work uh, in the region and indeed throughout South America, um, and was a finalist for the prize a couple of years ago. And Mike DeConchuk, like Vishaka, has been involved with the jury process for a number of years. Uh, Mike works with Beyond Conflict. Uh, he is sitting in Amman um, and commuting to Boston and doesn't seem to be with us at the moment. Uh, in any event, why don't we start the conversation, Vishaka? Um, I will stick around until Mike joins us. Thank you, Alan, and let's hope that Mike will join us, otherwise we will need magic again, and he will appear out of nowhere. So, Mark, stay with us and make sure that we might need your magic. Um, uh, greetings, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, because I know many of you are from many different parts of the world, which is what we love at Talberg. Um, as Alan said, Talberg Foundation, when we talk about global leadership, we don't think about global as an abstract thought. And we don't think about global as not rooted. 
but global more as relational. So it's more about leadership in global context. Um, I've had the honor and the pleasure of being on the jury right from the beginning, and I'm just so very proud of people we have selected. But what I want to do today, because you've talked about stories, is that each one of us, we thought we would just tell a little story, tiny story, but to see how we have fared during the pandemic and lessons we have learned. And all of you will have other ways to think about that. So I hope that that will kind of jog your own thinking about what you think about in terms of leadership, especially at this once in a lifetime, once in a century kind of uh, challenge that we've all faced. So I want to tell you the story about um, AFS International. This is American Field Service, which started actually as a magic after World War II, to really say, how do we not make these wars happen? And these ambulance drivers who were there actually thought, let's get young people to connect with each other. And I was one of these AFS students who came to America more than five decades ago. I don't want you to know exactly when, but the reality is that now I chair this program. And it's an international board. We have 90 countries we operate in now, and COVID happens. It's an existential threat. Existential threat because we are in the business of getting kids from one place to another and having this transformational experience, which Jan Eliasson also credits for being the global leader he is to that program since he was an AFSR. What we learned is that when it's an existential threat to your organization, what do you need to do? One of the things that we recognize is that, yes, each one of us had national constraints, but we're in the business of international, intercultural exchanges. How do you get these young people, 18 year olds, should they go back home? Should they stay where they are? Because in fact, the home, their original home is more problematic because of where COVID is. One thing we realize is that you had to hunker down. And that meant core values. Our core value is about intercultural education with young people. Our first priority was to get young people safe. Whatever it took, we have to do this. The second thing we realize is that all the processes and systems you have in place, guess what? They're only that, processes to help you achieve your mission. You better change the processes if that's what you have to do. So focus and flexibility. Flexibility in how you get to your core value and the goal. The third one that I think is really, really important is to recognize fallibility. Each one of us is fallible no matter how big a leader we are and recognize that therefore, good ideas are not embodied in one person. They can come from anywhere, but ask yourself whether you are the only one who has the answer or answer is coming from elsewhere. So recognize your own fallibility. And ultimately that leads to other core values about humanity that actually begin to be heightened when you're going in to this kind of an arena. And that's true of even Columbia University and the education and higher education, where I spend my day job uh, spending with young kids also coming for graduate program. So let me just stop there. And I'm sure that each one of us and Selena, as well as uh, I'm glad to see you, Mike. That's good. We didn't need uh, Mark to get the magic. So Mark, why don't you say a word about your specific story experience during this time and what you felt was your important takeaway? I think Mike, you're muted. Uh, Vishaka, you said Mark, sorry. I... Oh, I'm sorry, Mike, Mike. No, Mark is gone. Now we don't need his magic because you're there. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so I was just jotting down some notes based on what Vishaka was saying. You know, so my name is Mike Nikinchuk. I'm a neuroscientist. I work for Beyond Conflict in Boston, but I'm based in Amman, Jordan. Um, I lead a team of about 15 um, 
refugees and mental health practitioners and neuroscientists that are now scattered around the world. And over the past year, the entire way we work together has changed. Uh, the entire nature of what we do, how we do, who we serve, and how we serve them has fundamentally changed. We accidentally, you know, through a, a global physical health pandemic, ended up working in a shadow pandemic of mental health. It increased uh, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder for communities that we're serving. And being here based in Jordan, you know, we face some of the world's most severe lockdowns and still are living under many of those lockdowns. And I had a team, but three quarters of which didn't have good internet connection. So in a world that rapidly moved to everything being virtual and remote, what does it mean to support a team that doesn't even have the basic infrastructure and the world is leaving behind and you can't support them in the way you'd like to because they're in the bottom billion. Um, and for me, in the beginning of this pandemic, I was in the United States and then airports started closing. So I was stuck far away from my team in a place that I didn't necessarily want to be for that long, in a place where I didn't know anybody. So I was noticing that so many of the issues in working with, with refugee communities in the Middle East for so many years around lack of agency, having no way out, having your passport not be worth a damn, um, being stuck, having, you know, not only not having the means, but even if you do have means, you can't change your situation because this is an unprecedented time. The first thing that happened for me was a massive kick in the pants of empathizing with those who are on my team because we're a team of people of mixed levels of privilege, of economic and political and social status. And for me, it was a massive reminder of what the lived reality is for the many people living as the global poor, that even before a pandemic, you don't have the luxuries and freedoms of movement and of travel and of connectivity that facilitated a smooth transition to the pandemic and the work from home life. And it was a massive wake up call and, and, and a moment of empathy that changed how I relate to my team. Um, you know, it made me a much more honest uh, participant with, uh, with my team, being honest about my own mental health condition, watching myself go through periods of massive depression and anxiety during the pandemic um, and having to put my money where my mouth is, being a neuroscientist working in, in, in mental health, and then all of a sudden being very open with those who are expecting leadership around mental health service provision and saying, I need help and talking about how I'm getting help, where I'm getting help, talking about my journey with therapy and being sure that I'm modeling every behavior that I'm trying to preach to those who, who I'm working with. And then the last thing really has been around presence. What does it mean to be present? You know, I spent so many months uh, trying to get back to Jordan, trying to cross the Atlantic. What was once a very easy six hour task became six months of trying to connect with the right people and get into Europe, get into the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. And every string I pulled was a dead end. And so what does it mean to be present and the importance of being present for a team? And that doesn't mean having the answers because I have nothing to say to my team about what happens next. I don't know. None of us know what happens next. Since March, 2020, no one knows what the hell is gonna happen next, especially from country to country, county to county, community to community. So in the absence of certainty, which was once the thing that made me confident in leading a team, in the absence of any certainty, what does it mean to earn respect, to respect others, and to be present with people? Because simply being honest and being present has been all that I can do for my team over the past several months. And it's, trans it's really been humbling and increasing, um, very, very humbling in the process. So as we're now leading mental, online mental health programs for refugees around the world, you know, we're, I've it's changed... Uh, feeling more like a participant than a leader of anything. But I guess that's what it's about. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Vishika, should I, should I follow? Yes, please. please, please. So, you know, I totally get that feeling of being more of a participant than a leader. I think sometimes that kind of the question of leadership is so, can be so circumstantial too. Um, you know, I, I also, I was stuck in New York and um, we stayed, we, we went uh, kind of to a cabin for a while because we couldn't get back either, but we came, and I had COVID early last year and we came back to El Salvador in August um, and, and now we just got COVID again, my whole family last month. So we're second time around with COVID. Um, fortunately, you know, it's when you see so much 
death and and just um, you know the the impacts, the long term impacts of COVID uh, around you. It just seems our, in our case, it, I think bringing back what Mike said about privilege is really important. I mean, we we had access to healthcare and and the medications, and we were all fine. I think a few things that come to mind for me that came up being away. I also was away from the team and stuck for a while in the US and couldn't get back to El Salvador. And I think one thing that was really important that came out of that was really leveraging the resilience that exists. I too work in contexts of adversity of high levels of violence and um, conflict. Personally, I don't come from that context. I come also from a place of privilege. And I agree that this is very, high, right now that kind of difference is really, really heightened during a pandemic. But I think it making sure that we really allow others to lead and because mobility and access to communities was so difficult during the emergency and literally we had, you know, we had to pivot as an organization from providing ongoing programming to also addressing the emergency and literally getting food out to people and providing mental health support. Um, we had to really make sure we didn't centralize all the decision making uh, and 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 re relied on our colleagues that were living that are living in these communities, our partners. So I think one thing that is really important is to let others lead constantly, right? Not just in times of crisis, but really um, and 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 really take advantage of that that incredible strength and resilience that comes out during situations of crisis. And I think Alan said earlier, kind of these unexpected leaderships, where are they coming from? And really kind of put, you know, wind beneath and, and support them in what, what they think is most urgent and necessary. The other thing that I feel like we've really learned during this pandemic is, is not to overthink too much. Um, and I know Vishika said, you can kind of have, you know, hunkered down and in her story, she was talking about hunkering down. And I feel like it was almost like a, a combination of um, you have to do something. And at the same time, you're trying to figure out what strategy you're going to adopt. And, and in our case, we're like, we can't overthink it. I think it's kind of in, in, in a context like this, it's just move as you go and get things done. And we are going to make mistakes. Um, and, and we have to carry that humility and, and the readiness to make those mistakes. But definitely, we weren't able to overthink anything. We had to just figure it out, right? This, this event is about pivoting. We had to pivot quickly, figure out how to go online, how to provide frontline workers with training, whether it was online or in-person distance, um, how to get people food, literally, um, because so many people were out of work for so long. And then, and then I think finally, it, it goes a little bit with what Mike said, but being really comfortable in, in the discomfort, right? Being starting to get a groove because this lasted so much longer than I think any of us expected. We ended up, I think, as a team, learning to just deal with that, that we don't know what's going to happen. You know, stop, we, we had to kind of stop obsessing over trying to predict the timelines, when school is going to reopen, when, you know, healthcare was going to at least start addressing all these other issues and, and just exist in that space of uncertainty and discomfort and, and start being okay with it as a, as a reality that we have to deal with, which I, I believe and I hope will will make us better able to do all of our jobs moving forward, having learned to do this. There is a question actually, so we might all address that. Um, but the thing that you're all pointing out is this notion of, um, there were things we knew, right, before the pandemic, the notion of inequality, privilege, and all of that, but how much it came in sharp relief and therefore, it's not enough to just acknowledge, but model the behavior change. And that, I think, is, is something that you said, Mike, that I think is so important, which I always think about Gandhi, that phase, uh, phrase that, be the change you want to see in the world, meaning model the behavior that you want to see elsewhere, whether it's about flexibility, whether it's about humility or vulnerability. And at the same time, people do look to you. So the question that uh, Gina Romero has is that, how do you deal with the fear that this situation created and its affectation of the people that you work with and their views also of what we are all doing? <coughs> so, Michael Salina? 
Yeah, it's, uh, I, I work in the business of fear pre-pandemic, right? Yeah. So most of my work is on the neuroscience of post-traumatic stress disorder and the brain and body's response <coughs> to traumatic and stressful experiences in general and how those effects in turn go on to cause challenges for intergroup relations, for interpersonal relations. And I also myself suffer from an anxiety disorder, which makes the notion of fear and uncertainty <coughs> a very complicated, uh, very complicated relationship for me. And to model vulnerability for my team was incredibly new because um, especially in certain parts of the world, I'm thinking of the Middle East, thinking of Latin America. My family's from Guatemala and I've worked for 10 years in the Middle East. Leader, the word vulnerability is not associated with leadership very much. It's kind of antithetical to what it means to lead. Um, so to be in front of a team that says, and, and be able to say, I am struggling, but also a notion of personal responsibility. If I myself have to constantly make sure that I'm the one that talks to others about the strategies for what to do with anxiety and fear. I'm the one that's been lucky enough to live in a world of certainty. And like I said before, it's simply a, increasing the degree of empathy of saying, shit, this is what it's been like for you to be a refugee these past years, to have zero control over what's going to happen to you tomorrow. And it was humbling, but it also drew me closer to them. And it changed how we view professionalism in our interactions, that we can be professional and vulnerable at the same time. We can delegate and make mistakes so long as there's honesty and transparency in how we are doing moment to moment, whether it's in terms of how we're doing with internet connections or how we're doing in our heads and hearts. Um, and I've found nothing but grace and support from all the teams that I've worked with in Germany and the UK and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon. Um, in those moments when it was new for me to say, I can't do this task right now, I am struggling. I'm struggling with tremendous fear and uncertainty of what's coming next. Um, and I was worried that it was gonna jeopardize my status, frankly. Um, but it didn't. It simply increased our, our trust of each other. It, it, it humanized each other. And if, if nothing else, while the lines of privilege have not gone away between us, um, it has increased our, our trust. And that's yeah. something that I, that I don't regret. I, I think that head heart thing is so important, that bringing your whole self to work. Um, Selena, I know you've had yeah. similar experiences as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things is, um, and I know, and, you know, we also work with mental health, and I think it's also trying to figure out how we can focus on the things we can control, focus on the things that we, when you feel like everything is totally out of control, it's, I feel like it's a mixture of understanding how small you are in the universe, right, and you can't control everything, but at the same time, in your immediate space, mental space, physical space, focus on what you can control, um, in terms of what we can improve, right? So our teams were super overwhelmed with the human need, the, the loss, the, the pain, the grief. <clears throat> so I found that when, you know, we, we focused, okay, what, did it, what is it we can do? What can we reach? What can we do? Um, and really focusing on that helped, helped also inject some hope um, and optimism. And I think another thing that, that we found was really helpful was really discussing even making explicit what we saw right how people were coming together in communities to help each other even though you know there's poverty violence trauma there was this incredible moment of solidarity that does right. tend to happen during emergencies and how we could draw from that as well i mean i think it's, yeah. it's um that kind of focus at least has been helpful for me and just kind of pushing forward personally and, and then also with our colleagues and our, our teams. Yeah, I mean, I think that from what you're saying, and one of the things that I keep thinking about, which is what young people tell me, is that often they feel the only thing they know is a constant change. Things are changing so much that that produces anxiety. But one of the things that helps them is to think about what they need, but always think about the implication of their action for others. So what I call the independence in relation to interdependence. And what does that mean? Because 
everybody saw that communities came together, people came together to solve a problem, but how to stay with that idea as you go forward. And yeah. that in itself becomes a challenge because it's harder to do actually when things are not in such dire strait, you know, to actually remember that reflection and implication of your action on others, therefore modeling yourself in a way that people can also see that you really mean what you say. You know, that's such an important thing. And I think that, yes, go ahead. No, I said definitely. I think it is yeah. harder to do in non-crisis times. And and hopefully we can draw from, from this to continue to think like that. Because yeah. it is kind of the individual, the, the community, the system, they're part right. of these interplay post, in a post-COVID <clears throat> context. And in some cultures, it's easier than others. And I think America has shown that we have harder time dealing with both of those at the same time. Whereas in some other traditional communities, it's a little easier, you know. Um, I, I think recognize, that, Ashaka, a lot of that yeah. has to do just briefly with the, how communities have experienced crisis in the past. And the United yeah. States has been, a, has been a, a set of different, the United States is not one community. There's many United yeah. States, there's many Americas going on at the same time. And certain communities that have been more frankly exposed to chronic trauma and stresses and crises have a certain way of mobilizing that other communities don't, that more fractured individualistic communities don't. So in one sense, in working with refugee communities here, crisis is the name of the game. The body and the brain have become used to kicking into that moment right. of high gear with surges of dopamine and incredible focus and task shifting and code switching. And so if anything, we need to learn a lesson in the United States from many of the rest, many parts of the rest of the world. Right. No, absolutely. And with that, I think we have come to our conclusion for this. It's just a beginning of a conversation. I hope that it's, it really begins to spawn more conversations about how do we lead or not lead or where we are in the world today. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Well, that was really exciting. It's uh, wonderful to contemplate, you know, the nature and all of its wonder. And one way to do that is, is magic, uh, because we actually get to study what people actually react to. So uh, for many, many years, I spent time with neuroscientists and cognitive neuropsychologists thinking about the brain. And, and of course, artificial intelligence makes us think about these neural nets, which are very complicated. But uh, the more we study, we realize it's important also to observe nature in all of its wonder and fullness. So, um, uh, and actually we have to question many of our assumptions. I don't, actually right now, you can see that sometimes we, we just take things for granted that we don't even imagine. So, but we all look through the world in many different kinds of spectacles and glasses. Here's some right here. So here, let me tell you just a little bit about magic, right? Uh, it, this is a trick where you can see the different parts of magic at the same time. So we use the word trick to mean what magicians call the effect. And also we use the word trick to describe method. This is also true in, in many languages. So effect, what, you, the, what the magician uh, presents and the audience sees, that's the effect. There's also the method, that's the action that I do to help you see something. And there's a context in which that supports that or doesn't support that. So what's strange about magic, we're instantly in a world where facts are unusual things because facts are, it's as important to consider the context of a fact as the fact itself, because that's also recontextualizes the way we perceive that fact. So you get very quickly to an idea that's very adaptive. So let me show you. Um, so for the effect, this is what I love about this trick is that the effect, the trick that you're to see and the method are so closely aligned, you'll see them happen at the same time, right? So I have a glass and it goes right through the other glass. Now you can see exactly how I'm doing this if you think about it, right? But you can also realize, oh, <laughs> sometimes, right? You can see the effect of a glass going through a glass, but you can imagine how it's working, which is actually not complex. It's dropping the top glass and catching that and then dropping the bottom glass. But when you put it all together in the right context, 
you get a magic trick in which it appears that one glass goes through another. Now, even the context might be important. Um, when I travel, I use these unbreakable uh, plastic glasses, but then I'll, what I'll do is I'll add a little uh, sound like this. When you do this with glass, it's actually more spectacular because you, you hear a high frequency noise that just at the right moment startles the audience and it supports the illusion. So what I do with these is I, I if I'm gonna do it for an audience uh, and not explain it, I, I say these are, uh, this is the, the pattern of an old great magician named Charlie Miller. I say, here I have some tumblers. Notice I don't say glasses. I say tumblers because they're made of a substance unknown to science. And I'm gonna just let one glass tumble through the other. So, uh, but the, the big idea here is that in magic, there is this ambiguity right at this moment. There are these moments when you're not sure what glass is on top and what glass is on bottom. I've contextualized it and I've, I've taken into your account from your point of view, how it might look. And I try to support that with my actions. So uh, Peter knows that even in engineering, you have different kinds of engineers. You have engineers who think that their bridge will never fall down. They make their bridge and it will never fall down. And there's other engineers that uh, they, they ask the question, under what conditions will the bridge that I build fall down? And these are two very different ways of thinking. Right? One is certain and predictive. You know that your bridge will never fall down. And the other is adaptive because it understands instead of looking at the, the center of the certainty and prediction, you look at the edges of the acceptable range and think about is there is time a constraint or is an earthquake a constraint? What are the constraints that are so robust that it will destroy all my assumptions? So now we're at one of these critical times where you know a lot of our assumptions have been destroyed and we're rebuilding. Um, so I, I'm, I think of all of us have gone through amazing uh, periods of transitions. That's why it's so exciting um, that uh, that Peter and Pivot Projects have put on this this special and, uh, of meetings and a whole year of projects. And Talbert uh, is very very excited to be here. Uh, just in, as a way of wrapping up. I want to go back to the quote from Nelson Mandela. The most precious gift that we can give is actually time. And so I've got another kind of glass here and I'm going to place it right here. And I've, I've got, for New York right now it's 11, but we're going to select one more person. There's Alan who we used before uh, and there's Gina. Uh, Gina, how are you today? I'm just seeing you. I'm very good, thank you. Okay, we're going to bring you up. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, and where are you today, Gina? I'm in Bogota, Colombia. Oh, <laughs> perfecto. <laughs> ¿Cómo está? Muy How bien. Bogota? Okay. Well, Fría. <laughs> and is it 11 o'clock there as well? Is that one? Sorry? Is it 11 o'clock? 11 horas? It is 10. 10. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. Think about a dramatic incident that happened sometime in the last year, and then think of a time that you can associate it. But don't think about like 10 a.m. Think about a very specific time, right down to the minute, okay? Okay. And I'm going to, tell me when you have that time, because what I'm gonna do is start turning this watch, and I'm gonna not stop until you say that you have that time. And I'll try to keep everything right here in front of all of your eyes. Do you have a time in mind? Yes. Perfect, all right. So now I'm going to place the watch right here in my acrylic tumbler, <laughs> okay? And for the first time from Bogota, can you tell us the exact time? Now remember Nelson Mandela said the most generous thing that we can give to each other is time. And right now we're sharing time between us could you say the time, the exact time that There's you were no way this works. thinking of? Uh, it is 4.25 uh, p.m. or 16.25 in the no. military. Okay, 4.25, that's good enough. And is there a reason you thought of 
Yes, it is a, a moment in which we got a very bad news from my family. So that's just, oh. it just reminded. Okay, so we're thinking of you and to let you know that if you look very carefully at this watch, at that critical time, you were able to communicate it successfully right there and you stopped me exactly on 425. And that time, that precious gift of time is exactly like Peter reminded us that Nelson Mandela told us all about. That, that the most precious thing that we can give to each other is our time. And I want to thank all of you for the precious time with you. I'm going to pass you back to Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. One of the things I learned a long time ago in my career is never follow a very good act. Um, so I'm not, I'm not even going to try to tell you what time it is in Bogota. I still don't know. Uh, what I do want to do is thank you for joining us for this last hour. Uh, thank you, Peter, for sharing your stage with us. I'd like to remind everyone that we, you do all know great leaders, nominate a great leader. Uh, you'll find all the information you need at TelbergPrize.org. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce Anna Kahnenberg um, of GLAC. And over to you, Anna. Tell us about great leaders in, in GLAC. Thanks a lot, Ellen. And um, first of all, I would like to thank you again for the invitation uh, to Peter and um, to Ellen as well. Peter was a participant of one of our programs. And uh, ever since I got to know him last year, he was always talking about Pivot Projects and how wonderful this initiative is. And I know it's Pivot Week. And so, uh, First of all, on behalf of all of us, happy anniversary, happy first anniversary. And um, there was also always this idea that the two networks should somehow meet and do something together and get to know each other. So I was really happy that you invited us, Peter. And I hope we can invite you back sometime. So um, what is the Global Leadership Academy or short, uh, as we just call it, GLAC, um, was established in 2012 as a program in the framework of the German Development Corporation and uh, commissioned by the Ministry of International Cooperation and Development, the BMZ. And um, we work around three core points, um, dialogue, innovation, and leadership. Um, and from the very beginning towards finding new ways of solving really the grand challenges of our time and achieving uh, Agenda 2030. And what uh, we have been doing is we conducted 16 dialogue processes with the social lab method. They were multi-stakeholder dialogues with uh, change makers from all around the world and across all different sectors, from academia, public sector, private sector, to media and civil society. And um, yes, finally, eventually, the alumni of all these dialogues uh, from 2018 onwards started to become the GLAC community and we really focused on this network and bringing the resource <coughs> of these people together. And today it's a diverse network of uh, leaders that uh, has four regional hubs and um, we have around 700 change makers from 120 countries and who are driving their own projects in different contexts. And uh, I have some of them with me today. And I'm very happy uh, to introduce you now to the speakers and who will share their magical leadership stories with you. And um, the first story will come from Kami Firmin Ajahosu, um, who is a peacemaker. And uh, currently he is joining us from South Sudan, uh, the UN camp in Juba. He's working there for the UN peacekeeping mission. Uh, but today he will talk uh, about an initiative that he started in a personal capacity also during this COVID time. And uh, yes, he joined the GLAC community through uh, the Power of Diversity Lab in 2014. So over to you, Kami. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you to the audience. I'm very glad to share with you these stories about uh, Girl for Tech and Innovation Africa, a new hope 
born out of my quarantine hotel room in Entebbe. It was in August 2020 while attending the Gender Alliance Summit, uh, co-initiated by members of the BMW responsible leaders, the GDL, the BAN, and the GLA community, that I got the inspiration about the urgent need to support a massive enrollment of the African girls and women in uh, science, technology, engineering, uh, art and mathematics and robotics. If we actually want to reverse the current gender imbalance quickly. Back home few days later with my family, after one month uh, due to COVID-19 lockdown, I share the vision with my wife, Baijo, with online and uh, with some few friends. And she embraced the idea and decided to invest a time. And I can tell you, we have to work sometimes for two hours, 14 hours a day to bring that vision to reality. That was the beginning of the dream. That led a few weeks later to the incorporation of Girl for Tech and uh, Innovation Africa as a nonprofit organization based in Uganda, but with the continental outreach. We use, we, 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 our focus is to promote gender equality and empowerment of women and girls in Africa through the usage of technology and innovation. As you can see in the image, these are some of the activities that we undertake immediately. Five months later, Girl for Tech and Innovation Africa is blessed with six volunteers based in Uganda five volunteers in Ghana and here in South Sudan with me in a mission here, three other volunteers who are working with me on daily to, to bring out the ideas. And we're able to reach out to 2,500 people all over the, Afri the continent and beyond through our various projects. We managed to initiate four major projects, namely the Gear for Tech Innovation Africa STEAM and Robotic Educational Project that you see with our partner organization, in Uganda, face up. We also initiate the online, the female online talk show, which is a leadership program for women. Every month, we invite role model women to share on a particular topic and also to enhance other women and to empower them. We, al along the International Women's Days, we initiate a new project called the Girl for Tech Innovation uh, Girls and Women Heroine Series, which is a uh, a online interview to record the testimony of young girls and women to share and inspire other women. Lastly, we initiate a project calling a wearable digital solution, which is a, a digital bracelet for the social workers and parents dealing with disability to help them really to improve the service that the social workers are providing to the children with disability and be able also to lower the pressure on those social workers. This project is still in development, and thank God we have the privilege to participate in the UNICEF uh, founder uh, 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 bootcamp in Uganda last week among the uh, finalists for the first session. So this is what we have been doing, and all this for us is a magic, because you can imagine me here based in South Sudan, working here 24 hours, having a team in Uganda and support, but with the commitment and the dedication on everyone, we're able to make it. And we thank you all, and we welcome your question and comment. And this for us is also a sort of inspiration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kami. And uh, yes, as I said, uh, please put also any questions that you have in the chat, although we don't have really time to answer them now, but we are also happy to continue the conversation afterward. With this, I'm coming to our second uh, speaker, our second magical story, which comes from Maria Rosa Gamarra Cespedes. Uh, she is from Argentina and Bolivia, lives in Barcelona, and uh, she works with technologies for sustainability. Uh, joined the GLAC community very recently as a member of the Artificial Intelligence Lab uh, in 2020. And uh, she has extensive experience with alumni networks in Latin America, where she also worked for GIZ before. And um, she likes to connect the dots. And with this, I would like to hand over to you, Maria Rosa. 
Thank you, Anne. Uh, may I uh, share my screen, please? Okay, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share this story here about ask, think, and connect. Many years ago, I used to work uh, mainly in the financial sector, always uh, involved within technology development. Nowadays, I work as sustainability manager and technology development international expert. Excuse me. More than once, I asked it, how can we ensure technology development for the common good that doesn't increase the gaps that are destroying our world? And my thinking goes to the idea for working for impact. And there is an image about, uh, not a good one, but uh, about the amazing invent alumni program in Latin America, later merged into GIZ. And this program gave me a great opportunity to collect light and shadows from invent alumni on how the concept of green economy was perceived and worked within very different contexts there. I connected people and knowledge and I learned that we don't change values and values determine our behavior. In 2008, I asked again if combination of knowledge and values to promote public policies can effectively focus on improving the lives of the disadvantaged. My thinking went to the development of a national case study in Brazil within the project Spaces for Engagement Using Knowledge to Improve Proper Policies. I connected again many things and there I realized that it not, it is it's not necessary to be a think tank to get great impact, only to have the right combination of values and knowledge. And asking again why climate change is terrible for the environment, but even more for the poor. Thinking, I decided to write a short article that received an international prize within the contest ideas and views of climate change in 2009 and connecting people again and knowledge. I realized that scientific knowledge is not good enough to promote collective action. We need to have more dialogue where everyone has a place where no one is left out. Asking again, how much further do we need to go to interact with an environmental reality that is backing into a corner even to science I'm thinking about tools to improve connections after to be in charge of a national case study on green and inclusive growth in Bolivia. I have the opportunity to implement transdisciplinary dialogues and voices of the protagonists were heard as never before, strong and clear. Asking again, my question was, are there realistic opportunities for a more sustainable development of the Andean region within the framework framework of climate change. My thinking went to a scientific visit to the Amazon with the support of the German Academic Exchange Service. And in 2016, uh, I got in touch with Anna Kaiser, Lund University of, from Sweden, that shared uh, with me her doctoral thesis focusing on the rights of the Pachamama. And I felt that it was time to connect widely. With a very small team, we implemented a pilot knowledge hub, which operated in Latin America and supported projects in the field of cooperation for development. The pilot we implemented supported organizations like Latin Network, Swiss Cooperation for Development Office in Bolivia and other actors. And it was included in the World Bank Knowledge Hubs community and participated in two global events in South Korea, in. 2014, Washington DC, 2016. It was verified and supported by Connect Americas as well as by the Nexo program, Inter-American Development Bank, to improve the management model and also was supported by a sub-program from Germany. And we realized that as a small organization with a strategic knowledge and strong values, we felt capable to get a big impact. And currently we are here in Barcelona, implementing on circular 
on a new project focused on circular economy, energy, artificial intelligence, etc., to ask, think, and connect, connect again, and participating on this um, very big initiative globally, Women for Change, because we think it is time to connect better and more. And maybe I can talk about other experiences and very important international crises and God, only asking, thinking, and connecting. But it, it is not necessary, I think, because the idea to share with you today is only this. Optic experience of us. Ask, think, and connect to build together a magical future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria Rosa. And thanks for your inspiration and your story. And um, again, you can leave your comments or questions in the chat. Um, now we are coming to our next speaker. And I'm very happy that now uh, is with us uh, Rola Jadalla, who grew up in Libya and Jordan. And she is an assistant professor at the Arab University in Jenin in Palestine. Uh, but she says that at heart, she's a student for life. Committed to be part of this unique effort. Can you please uh, mute uh, yourself, everyone? Um, yes, Rola participated in our very first leadership and innovation lab, uh, the Passion and Politics Lab in 2012, which was about the challenges in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Over to, to you, Rola. Thank you. My name is Rula Jadallah. Yeah, I live in Jenin, Palestine, and I will speak about uh, my journey with leadership through my position as a vice mayor in Arab municipality. And before going to that uh, point, I just want to say that I was born in Libya and I raised in Jordan. And after the agreement, if you uh, know about Oslo, people, uh, Palestinian people out from outside start to go back to Palestine. And I was one of those who go back to Palestine. Before uh, 1996, I never know Palestine because I never been there. I just saw Palestine in uh, TV. And my knowledge about Palestine is there is a place for between Israeli and Palestine. And at that time, I, I was about 20 years old and I was I were very recognized in Jordan. I was the, uh, I have high degrees in university and I were promised to have a good position in Jordan after I finished my university and suddenly I have to put all of these plans away. And because I am a, a female and my father have eight daughters, he asked us to go to join him, his uh, going back to Palestine because he is not able to leave any female living alone in Jordan. And uh, I don't know if you know anything about Arab culture, females at that time and still till now they are not allowed to be uh, self-dependent and live uh, alone in their uh, uh, separate from their families unless they get married. And uh, from there I start my journey in Palestine. I continue my master degree and I get to uh, know to my husband, I get married and I start thinking about myself. I am now married, I have babies. What will be my future? I, I was dreaming all the time that I will be a doctor in university. I will be an effector one in the community. And now look, I am living in Jenin, in a village in Jenin that, that, that never believe in women and the strength of women. And I have to take care of my job. I have to take care of uh, having money to raise my family. I have to take care of my husband who is a male and he is affected from the opinion of the community because uh, it is not allowed to say that your uh, wife is very strong and she's stronger than you. And I have to balance all of these uh, and still keeping my dream to be a recognized woman in, in, in the community. 
At that time, I get a chance that uh, there were election in 2020, uh, 2012, and the election were for the municipality. And by law, the uh, people who are going to elect themselves, they should have women. It's by law, not because women, they should be there. The law says that about 20% of the elected people should be women. And at that time, some people came to my house and asked me to join them in the election. And they told me that everything will be fine and just we need your name. And I didn't know that uh, saying just need your name, they mean that they just want a female sitting in the chair and saying nothing. So I thought you know, uh, I have a chance to be in, in that place. I agree. And after we won the election, I was uh, shocked that the people who were with me and won the election, they divide the position of mayor between them. We are elected for four years. For every year, there will be a mayor from the people who join me in this uh, experiment. And I was excluded. And I asked them, what is my role? I, I just want to be a vice mayor. I don't want to be a mayor because if I want, if I became a mayor, I have to lose my uh, university job. They told me, you are came from small family, you are uh, a female. What do you think that you are going to do here? I told them, then I will be away. And they know they can't kick me out because the law says there should be a woman in the uh, council. And from that moment, they start to know that there is a female here. And this female is not just a chair sitting there. She will have an opinion. And I start to affect the, the people in my area by joining any meeting, by joining any workshop, by joining any activity in the community. I start to go to streets. If there is any problem with the street, I start joining, uh, helping in having, uh, let's say, solution. And at the same time, there were a lot of people who are not happy with the people who were the addiction. I start making, let's say, meeting with those people and ask them, why you are angry? They said, you, are, uh, you didn't do anything for us. I told them, we won the election yesterday. We don't have a chance. Just give us a chance for doing something. And from that moment, I start thinking, what should I do? As a, a, a female, I start thinking that I should affect the females who are living in the area. I should use my connection with these females that they can affect their husbands to help us, especially in funding certain, uh, let's say, uh, projects in the area. And uh, let's say uh, uh, I did something and yes, we uh, affect a lot of people to help us in funding. And by the four years, we have a playground in Arabe, we have a Turkish bath in Arabe, we have a school for agriculture. And I was all the time speaking with people, we want to do Arabe in a well-recognized way in agriculture and in sport. And after four years, our experiment was very distinguished. And this distinguished was very recognized in a conference in um, uh, Latin America. There were a conference for uh, urban planning for the next 20 years for the world. Arabe was a role model in the, man, uh, in the municipality council function and the one who uh, uh, let's say, uh, tell the story about Arabe, it was me in that conference. But after that, after we finished our period four years, there were a new election. The people who were working with me never chose me because they thought that I will not be a chair. And again, I have a, another chance in my area to be the first woman to lead a sport club in the area. And at that time, people thought a sport club needs a lot of money and we have to ask all the time for funding. I told them we are not going to ask for funding. We are going to create our own budget. And they told me what you are going to do. I told them we are going to make a different disciplines of uh, sport like karate, like tennis. And we will bring uh, some uh, people to train the children and we will take money from these children 
this money will help us to support ourselves and at the same time we will help mothers to make their sons and daughters feel safe in a place which will take care of their health of their education and of being engaged in the community and nowadays i feel i am very happy from myself i am a teacher in the university i use my let's say connection in the university to engage my students in uh, the community by taking them for a lot of trips and asking them we are going let's say for a trip for this village i don't uh, want you just to make a picture for yourself i want to make an, a, a movie short movie and I'll, i will make competition between my students who will make a good movie for this area and for this he will gain marks but at the same time he will get let's say competition with, between others and by this competition he will know how to work with team how to introduce himself and how to be part of this community nowadays i think i have a lot of followers on facebook twitter uh, instagram most of these people ask me rula you start from nothing how you are powerful i told them i just believe in myself i believe in my spirit and i believe in my knowledge and i know if i know this knowledge could be changed to experience and to skills i will be distinguished all the time and i will be happy if anyone take all of this spirit and use it to be a positive person in the future and in the community thank you thank you rola and um, i would like to ask everyone it's okay if we stay five minutes longer uh, we started a little late and uh, we still have uh, two stories um so Sorry. it's really uh, like for you to stay and and hear them as well um so, yeah, don't worry it's fine yeah okay thanks peter um we have our next but that's marta sofia nino zulkowska who is a biologist with a master's in city management and she's about to complete a phd in public administration working with the mexican ministry of environment and natural resources and um, she's also a teacher in several academic programs which she feels is a privilege and uh, she joined the black community um, via the urban innovation leadership lab in 2015 and she's going to talk about an initiative called opening horizons to the common welcome Marta. okay thank you uh, first thank for all of you about, about the opportunity to share with us this uh, be part of this unique event and uh, share the story that arise of uh, uh, my personal vision about the one decision worldwide related with the generalized adoption sure. of the sustainable sure. development. Uh, uh, about sustainable development agreement uh, that seems like a magic formula to transform the world. Uh, never least, almost 30 years ago, the 2030 agenda reiterates this vision and new again calling for a different effort to be made to reverse the current development trends characterized by the multidimensional crisis immersed in an uncertain scenarios that are exacerbated by the health pandemic that all of us are experiencing. Beyond the speech, uh, Sustainability is not just another attribute of development that can be by or transferred from one reality to another. Sustainability necessarily implies a rethinking of development through a local creative process uh, because it is in the places in where the conflict of interests are expressed and from where the solutions based on a collective conscience regarding the socioeconomical, uh, socio-environment value can arise. Um, big city complex systems dependent and at the same time determining our local and global environment, we have to, uh, to introduce a new integrated approach 
can that can be able to open possibility to reverse these trends that are devastating our rural and natural environments and causing the migration from the countryside to the city that exacerbated the urban poverty. Uh, the story deals with an innovative experience in Mexico consisting for application of model created to facilitate the adoption of an integrated approach in the planning and management of the city. This experience was carried out attending to different problems in Mexican cities, face-to-face -face and virtually uh, in a virtual manner, uh, showed an exercise to make visible the interdependencies between the diversity of interests usually in conflict in response to individual positions that, rather than uh, a city as a whole. The central idea was promote uh, an understandable way the, uh, the, the vision of the city as a common good, and from this start up one process of reflection and dialogue uh, across different actors that allows identifying the routes to follow to be ensure uh, synergies, address gaps, and avoid duplications for the benefits of all. This is very important because um, Always we are uh, make interventions from our particular point of view and not from the uh, uh, understanding the realities and position of, of other actors. Uh, so the application of this model in different contexts it's a given, uh, it, it was given a first step to promote the well being and highlighting, for example, the importance of the conservation of ecological process on which the environment quality of cities depends. It is allowed that different actors understand their differential responsibility in, in, in topics like climate change and uh, identify. Uh, give possibilities to identify opportunity areas from their field of intervention, highlighting the importance of promoting coherency of his work based in a collective work. Uh, the experience was shown us to be able to break traditional sectoral, political, administrative, and even disciplinary natural approach and apply, and apply uh, knowledge and technology to pro provoke interest in exploring scenarios uh, with key actors, for example, local governments that has very important responsibility to, to the development of the city. There are no magic formulas to can, uh, that can be adopted. We need uh, urgently change our understanding of the causes of socioeconomic problems at all levels and act consistently with it. Being able to perceive reality from the holistic reference in the face of the complexity, open new magical avenues for change from our own possibility. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marta. Thank you to Mexico. And really, now last but not at all least, uh, I want to introduce you to Helen, Helen Lunku Setanyinga from Uganda. Um, we have already been in the forest of Uganda now, we are on the countryside. And uh, Helen joined the GLAG community through the Unveil the Hidden Presence Trafficking in Women and Children Lab in 2018. And um, she says about herself that she is a mother 200, a gender activist, a human rights defender. And her role is that she is the founder and executive director of the Rape Hurts Foundation and a voice for the voiceless. Helen, please. Hi everyone. I am really humbled uh, to see you here and taking your time to listen to our stories. I am the executive director of Repats Foundation that is started way back in 2008 as I graduated from the uh, university. Uh, the reason behind the start of Repats Foundation was to advocate for the rights of women and children 
who are still vulnerable and looked at as a property in Uganda by most men. Uh, I have a lot to speak about Repart Foundation, but not today. Basically today, I want to talk about one of the model villages that I developed. We developed with my partners, uh, my team, to ensure that uh, women in a Bucherimba village get access to clean water, get uh, uh, food security through irrigation, uh, get solar power uh, lamps, uh, like uh, lighting, street lights. Uh, since uh, being having grown up in that village, I was a victim of uh, rape, now a survivor, fighting for the rights of women. And uh, the reason why I decided to make um, the, my village a uh, Mondo village is to ensure that women are protected. Even at night, when they're from fetching water, firewood, or anything, they are safe, not to fall a victim as I was uh, 11 years, uh, 13 years back. And, uh, just a minute. The, the construction of a uh, solar water system started last year, uh, 2019, after a fundraising, a fundraising, a fundraising uh, uh, program that took place with the help of SELF. SELF is called uh, in full is, uh, Solar Electric Fund that is best in US, I contacted them because I wanted to make sure that my village, people don't go through the same situation. What I went through, we lived in the dark. Can I continue? Can you please uh, unmute uh, yourselves, uh, everyone? Uh, or can someone mute everyone? So uh, we constructed, uh, with the help of SELF, uh, Solar Electric Fund, that is based in US, in 2019, we started the construction of the water pump. Uh, we started the construction of uh, water storage pump tanks that can supply over 1,000 uh, people with. We went ahead and fundraised for the uh, solar street lights. So far, we've installed 16. Actually, there are 24 solar uh, lights on the streets of uh, Bucherimba village that is located in Kamuli district, Uganda. And as I speak now, such homesteads with over 500 people are benefiting with disconnected water. They are no longer walking distances. Because I remember I growing up would walk over one, two kilometers to go and fetch water. And this involves walking at night because remember you have to go to school and then you come back home to fetch water. So by the time you walk to go to, to fetch water or fetch firewood, it's late. And this is the time that perpetuators use the advantage gum and grab women and rape them forcefully. So as Rep Parts Foundation, we have we had made sure we want to make Bucherimba and other villages within uh, Uganda that can access water within their home without walking kilometers, getting security lights on the streets so that the perpetrators do not use the advantage of darkness to grab people and you don't have even a witness. Someone has raped you, but you don't have a witness. So it looks like you're acting. But now with the light, at least people can walk, walk freely in the roads without threats. As I speak now, Uganda has experienced a high rate of teenage pregnancy. In the district, where, what I'm talking about, we have cases 3,120 3, teenagers, children below 15 years are pregnant as I speak now. But I want to speak with confidence that in my village, we don't have any case of teenage pregnancy. This is because of the initiative that we've, take, that we've taken as Red Parts Foundation to ensure that the children, women are protected against rape, against GBV, and making sure that if there is any chance of any case, there is legal action taking place. There is care, health care centers taking place, to, taking care of these victims. I have a lot to say, but I would say that we've saved waterborne diseases in the, in the region of Bucherimba 
uh, in 2019, we had cases of over 20 people dying of uh, day century waterborne related diseases. I, as, as I speak, by March, we didn't have any cases. Whereby families were spending over $85, one to $85 in March, from December to March, we've not had any case of any waterborne diseases. So it means that the families are saving. As we are protecting women against GBV, the health is improving, they're having clean water, they're having total security. And I, as I speak now, the Speaker of Parliament of Uganda wants to meet me after the uh, integration of the president and all the uh, members of parliament. She wants to meet me so that we see that this model village is replicated or it's taken into other areas. Yes, uh, I have a lot to say, but let me just stop here for today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm so humbled. Greetings from Uganda. Wonderful, really, truly uh, inspiring, Helen. Thank you so much. And I have nothing more to say, uh, but also thank you for having us. And I think I will hand it over back to Peter. Yes, thank you so much, Anne and Alan, for that really incredibly inspiring and moving set of presentations. And all of those who spoke have really moved and inspired us so much. And the Shaka at the beginning said that courage, effort and method, and then process and impact uh, have come together to create magic. And I count at least 20 countries that we've heard from today. Uh, you've talked about the absence of certainty after the COVID uh, impact and that being present is so difficult now in the present circumstances and that inequality has been magnified everywhere. But as we've heard, your local leadership is really countering that and finding ways to, to, to find comfort in discomfort and uh, safety in, in, in lack of safety. And, and you've talked a lot about looking for resilience within communities and nourishing the roots of existing resilience uh, and increasing and building trust, which obviously uh, in the last example, we can see how that can happen. Uh, to listen, to, to ask, to think and connect and create pilot knowledge hubs uh, and move forward. So I thought that as I started with Nelson Mandela, I might finish with Nelson Mandela, uh, who said, it, it always seems impossible until it's done. And all of you have demonstrated uh, that that is possible. But of course, for all of you, it's just the beginning. And finally, Pivot Projects is here to, to help you. So all of you who've spoken, if you want additional help and support on anything, you can join Pivot Projects and, and access a, a very large group of people who are willing and interested to help you. So thank you all so much. Congratulations to Talberg Foundation on their wonderful initiatives. And we hope that some of the people who've spoken might consider being put forward for an award because they seem to me to be very inspiring. So thank you all very much. It's been a wonderful occasion. And thank you for honoring us with your presence today. And please all stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.